Hi there, welcome back to IndyCar on the 28th of September. Apologies for my absence over the last couple of days. Um, I have been in hospital having various things done to my hearing. Uh, one of those things was, uh, as a permanent hearing aid wearer who's deaf on one side, occasionally I have to have wax removed from the ear in which the hearing aid's located. But this time, unfortunately, the wax was actually hardened onto my eardrum. And despite the doctor's best efforts at chipping away at this stuff, she accidentally managed to perforate my eardrum. Now, I'm saying accidentally because it was entirely accidental and she can't really be blamed for this. It was a very difficult and delicate operation trying to remove the stuff. She managed to get half of it away and it seemed like everything was fine until I got home and suddenly my hearing switched off completely on the right hand side, which left me largely deaf and I discovered a small amount of blood and fluid leaking from my ear so that told me I had a perforated eardrum almost immediately understood what that meant it now means that I'm going to be at least mostly deaf well, it's profoundly deaf for the next few days while this heals however it doesn't now stop me from working today I have had some of my hearing starting to return so here we are on the 28th and a couple of news stories caught my attention this morning one of which I think um, it's largely gone unnoticed in the mainstream media, but as usual, it's picked up by the investigative uh, newspaper, The Ferret. And that is a piece of information regarding SEPA, the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, which uh, was subject to a freedom of information request looking for the register of companies in Scotland which have permits to pollute. Now, this might sound a surprising thing for an environmental uh, protection agency to do, but it is meant to keep a register of any companies in Scotland which have a permit to pollute the environment, presumably because there's no help for it or they can't find another way of dealing with the pollution. Anyway, what's interesting about this is that, according to the statistics coming from SEPA, there was a marked increase in the number of these companies actually asking for these exceptional uh, permissions to pollute. It went up from something like 1,100 companies previously uh, to most recently 175,000. So it went up from, sorry, not 1,100, from 11, from 101, is that 101,000? 100,000, let's say, just above that, to over 175,000 companies. Now that's an increase of almost 75%. But what's weird about it is the fact that, according to SEPA, after getting this um, request, it was discovered or announced that SEPA had been subjected to a cyber attack in December. Now, this cyber attack appears to have compromised all of this data. Uh, and according to SEPA, who were answering uh, to another organization, which was asking them, why this information couldn't be made available. According to SEPA, the information is either completely lost, encrypted, or has been wiped off the face of the database by this alleged um, cyber attack. Now, th this got my radar going. This is an immensely convenient time for this cyber attack to have done this, because this is exactly the time when the United Kingdom government has just announced two enormous U-turns on its environmental commitments. The first one was last week when Richie Sunak announced that the ending of production of diesel and petrol cars in the United Kingdom instead of happening in 2030 was now being pushed back to 2035, a delay of some five years. Now this was met with uh, enormous protest because this was a complete uh, U-turn on Sunak's pledges on climate change. And it meant that the British car industry, which was already gearing up for the 2030 deadline, has now had to redo all of its plans. And in fact, the car industry didn't want this to happen. So who benefits from Rishi Sunak rolling this, this date back a bit? Well, the only answer to that, I think, is probably the oil companies, who are now going to have another five years of petrol and diesel production to look forward to. And as we also know, Sunak has only just announced that a new uh, oil field, the, I think it's the Rosebank field, uh, to the north, I believe the north of Shetland, 
has now been given a license to produce. And it is one of the largest oil fields uh, remaining in the North Sea. In fact, it is the largest. Now, this, to me, suggests that the entire United Kingdom climate change target system has been abandoned completely. But not only that, but the largest polluters in Scotland, the ones affected by this alleged data breach and the loss of this data, according to the ferret, are companies like petrochemical plants in Mossmore and Grangemouth, which routinely spew a lot of nasty stuff into the environment. Uh, but also it includes things like high-intensity farming, uh, chemicals plants, and all kinds of other industries which pollute the environment. So it's highly convenient, I think, that this data should suddenly disappear exactly the moment when the government is introducing measures which are going to increase pollution for five more years and increase the production of oil and gas from the North Sea. So it's a little bit odd that it's happening right now. Now the other thing that caught my attention today was the suspension of Fergus Ewing, the SNP's MSP. Now, Fergus Ewing has written a, an open letter which appeared on the internet today explaining his reasoning uh, for why he has opposed various SNP government policies over the, the last few years. And he listed several of them, one of which was the uh, bottle return scheme, which I think has rightly been criticised as being uh, not at the moment, at least, um, all that feasible for companies to actually do because there wasn't sufficient consultation and time given for drinks companies to make the necessary arrangements to change the kinds of packaging that they use. And the other ones that he listed were things like transportation and the Scottish government's um, ill-fated scheme to stop people reinstalling gas boilers, but to actually force people under legislation to install new green uh, energy systems in their homes, mostly concerning things like ground-sourced heat pumps. Now, there hasn't been enough research, and there certainly isn't enough scaled-up production of ground-sourced heat pumps to make them affordable for most people. And so, of course, this met with a great deal of resistance from many members of the public who were concerned that their old gas boilers would now have to be replaced with massively expensive ground source heat pumps. As well as that, we've had things like the, the Gender Recognition Reform uh, Act, which was deeply unpopular. I'm not sure if that was something which Mr Ewing was against, but you never know. And his other mentions were things like transportation. Now, Fergus Ewing's constituents had been expecting, and rightly so, the A9 and A96 to be upgraded to improve the connectivity between his constituents and the rest of Scotland. And this, again, in terms of Scottish Government policy, appears to have been rolled back. And this is not happening at the moment. He also mentioned Scotland's fishing restrictions, uh, which were designed, presumably, to protect species and to protect uh, areas of special environmental interest across the coast of Scotland. But unfortunately, these also negatively affected the fishing industry and Mr Ewing's constituency. Uh, constituency. So all, for all of these reasons, he has opposed, quite, uh, I think, vigorously opposed these, uh, these new pieces of legislation because, as he says, they conflict with his primary function as an MSP, which is to represent the views of his constituents. And his constituents are not happy about any of these particular new pieces of legislation. So I think in the round, if I were to sum up these two pieces of information today, that we can see two levels of government uh, legislation operating simultaneously in Scotland. In the first instance, the British government in London, or I should say the English government in London, run by the Tories, is imposing its will on the massive polluting industries in Scotland, ex rapidly expanding them and enabling uh, these firms, these multinational corporations, to extract more of Scotland's valuable natural resources at our expense, whilst polluting the environment with impunity because they have simply stopped obeying the rules that they set themselves. Now, I would suggest that organisations in Scotland, government organisations such as the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, perhaps the Scottish Development Agency, and the Scottish or now Scotland Office, all of these organisations, these governmental organisations which purport or brand themselves as Scottish or involving Scotland are nothing of the kind. These are British government 
uh, organisations which are there to enable their big donors from big business to keep doing what they're doing. And in the meantime, the Scottish government is left with the crumbs. And that means it's ended up having to shift the environmental burden onto the actual people themselves. Thereby, you get pieces of legislation like the, the fishing bill, you get pieces of legislation like the bottle return scheme, and so on, where the burden of environmental protection has been shifted from SEPA and from these big multinational corporations to us, the poor old individuals, who are trying our best to do what we can to limit um, our effect on the global climate change. So it seems to me, as usual, that Scotland is not allowed to do anything which would actually protect the environment properly, whilst the British government gets away with doing whatever it likes here, and in the process making massive amounts of money from Scottish resources, for which the Scottish people have never given their consent in the first place, and were not, and I repeat this, not ever included as any kind of uh, condition of the Union Treaty in 1707. Nobody knew about oil in 1707, and the Treaty of Union gives England no rights whatsoever to plunder these resources, to use them, or to pollute the environment of Scotland in any way. So I think we can safely say that the Scottish government is pretty much hamstrung as usual and the British state can run rampant through the Scottish countryside and its seas, polluting everything in sight as they wish and stripping the, co the country of all its natural resources for their own benefit. Billions of pounds worth of oil and gas to be extracted, all of which benefits the British, uh, <laughs> the British government and none of it ever seems to return to Scotland, and certainly none of it seems to be flowing into the constituency of Fergus Ewing. So here we are, just again witnessing the impotence of Scotland in the face of the might of the British imperial project to capitalise on Scotland's resources whilst polluting the environment without anybody having to do anything about it, except poor you and I. Anyway, that's it for me today. These are just my observations. I'm making a link between what I see as two news stories, which seemingly unconnected. The former, the one about SEPA, seems to not have attracted any media attention at all, which you might expect from the UK media. The other one heavily focusing on Fergus Ewing and his disagreements with his own party. So there you have it. The usual story of uh, British rapacious exploitation of Scotland's resources and Scotland's feeble government attempts to do something about it. Anyway, that's it from me today. I'll be back again, I hope, tomorrow. We'll see how things go with, I hope, some new news for you. In the meantime, keep the faith and remember that unless we actually empower our own parliament to hold a referendum, we cannot change any of this polluting behaviour by the UK and we cannot ever benefit from any of our natural resources while we are attached to this lopsided, asymmetrical union of exploitation and colonisation. I'll see you soon. Bye for now.